Chapter 16 Make it up with your old man, Marcus, because we're all a long time dead. Forgive him. Forgive yourself. When he's gone, you'll be ready to give everything for one more minute with him. Carlos Santiago, still trying to broker peace between the phoenixes. Aspo Fields, COG Front Lines, 0145 Hours. Carlos's radio came to life. Kelowna Control, patrols inbound from the northeast. Heads down, people, just in case. He could hear Merritt's two patrols long before he could see them. They thundered toward Aspo and Peresva from the northeast. A beautiful long storm of a sound that said everything was going to be all right. The Indies were going to take a pounding. Go, Cremum, Carlo said, straining to look over his shoulder. Go, go! And they said they couldn't cross a fighter with a bomber, Marcus muttered. Shit, look at that! His voice was drowned out by a burst of fire. Without NV goggles, the battlefield was a chaotic, deafeningly noisy landscape of brilliant flaring lights plunging in and out of pitch black. A huge explosion lit the sky to Carlos's right for a few seconds. He took a deep breath for a bellowing cheer before he realized it wasn't cog firepower, but a mid-air detonation. Fireballs scattered and fell to the ground. The split-second gasp on all the radios made his scalp tighten and his gut cramp. It's hit, someone said. Shit, they got a patrol. Asps, Marcus said. We need to take those bastards out, Phoenix, Stroud said. Or everyone's screwed. The roar of the other patrol continued, sounding as if it was climbing out of ASP and AA range. There was another whoosh of hot gas, and a missile streaked high into the night sky. A few terrible unbreathing seconds later, another explosion and a massive ball of fire filled the sky. Shit! What have they got? That was Mataki's voice. How are they locking on so well? I don't know, Stroud said. She was just meters from Carlos and Marcus now. Phoenix, take the first asp, left. Jacobs, how many long spears has your section got left? Two, ma'am. Make em count then. Second asp and the AA piece nearest you. Long spears were one-man launchers, but Carlos braced Marcus's back with his knee as he aimed and fired. The asp was already moving before he pulled the trigger, but Marcus was a good marksman, and... Fuck, he spat. The asp was right on the long spear's limit, moving right again, and the missile went wide by half a meter. It took out something in a ball of flame, a tree, or maybe it just hit the ground, and Carlos grabbed the last missile to load it for Marcus. He's moving out of range. To the other side, Jacobs wasn't having much luck either. The Asps knew the gear's limits. One of the LAVs wasn't so smart, though, and took a long spear up the tailpipe. Carlos could see other armor moving up to the Asps. As Marcus fired, an APC cut across the line of fire and caught the incoming missile fully broadside. Carlos saw the plating fly off in all directions. At any other time, the kill would have raised a cheer, but all it represented now was Marcus's last long spear wasted. Shit, shit. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry. Okay, Phoenix. You did fine. One less threat on the field. So, no pressure, Jacob said cheerfully. The very last long spear streaked away and Carlos didn't even have time to focus on its jet. But the asp had fallen back, moving into a knot of other vehicles. The missile detonated and the machine gun position vanished. 
The difference between turning a battle and defeat could be a matter of centimeters. Marcus kept cursing himself under his breath, one hand blocking the radio's mic, and Carlos felt terrible for him. But he hadn't failed. It just wasn't doable there and then. All he could do was grip Marcus's shoulder hard and try to move him on from the feeling the battle was his sole responsibility. And Carlos could hear helicopters. He fell back on his elbow to look up at the sky, but he couldn't see any navigation lights. The chimeras were waiting, circling a little way offshore. Kelowna control to Longstop, said Anya Stroud's voice. Merritt is scrambling the next of its patrols, but it's going to take 10 to 12 minutes. Cleaner is now ready to exfil. Stand by to pull out. What about the medevac? Major Stroud asked. The asps are going to drop them before they're anything near the LZ. We've got no ground to air left. We're down to RPGs. We're going to have trouble suppressing asp fire. Stroud paused for a minute, and her voice changed completely. She was another woman for just a moment. You're doing fine, darling. Really fine. I'm proud of you. It silenced everyone for a few seconds. Carlos could always hear when everyone on the net was listening hard. All the background noise and breakthrough of local chatter stopped dead. Stroud never broke radio procedure on comms with personal chat, let alone in the middle of a battle, and it made Carlos hold his breath. There was a definite finality to it. He could guess what she was thinking. She wasn't sure if she was coming out of this. Anya seemed to hesitate for ages. And you, Major, she said. Carlos couldn't bear it. He cut in one syllable before Marcus. Ma'am, let me get closer to the asps. I can put one out of action if I get close up. I'll do it, Marcus said, and started to get up. Stroud grabbed his pants leg at the knee and pulled him down again. She was closer than Carlos had thought. I've got more practice at this, Corporal. You and Santiago, go right and lay down some fire. Keep as many of them busy as possible. She changed channels. Alpha, Bravo, and Echo fire teams, regroup on Mataki. Mataki, I want half your troop securing an LZ on the beach, and another half giving the Indies all they've got from as far from me as possible. We are leaving. Ma'am, Mataki said, if you're thinking of crossing that terrain on your own and doing what I think you're going to do, they'll pick you up right away. How well you know me, Sergeant, Stroud said. You'll just have to keep them very, very busy. What are the choppers waiting for? Marcus asked. The chimeras still weren't over land. If they were, they could have shot up C Company pretty fast. They're not after us. They're here for something else. Well, I can't fart around waiting for them to choose from the menu. Stroud sounded as if they were just a minor irritation, and loaded more grenades on her webbing. That case of axe going to land whether they like it or not. Keep an eye on the asp left of us. Give me a few minutes. She dashed out from the cover of the grasses, and Carlos heard her splash into a channel. She was gone before Marcus could protest. She's nuts, Carlos said. She has got a point. If she has, so have I. Carlos had served alongside women for two years. They had to be as physically capable as the men. But at that moment, it didn't sit right with him to see a woman of his mother's generation having to wade through shit and mud under fire. The fact that she was an officer was irrelevant. All his instincts told him to protect and respect. Come on. Marcus tugged his sleeve and began crawling through the sedge. You heard a lady. Yes, you did, Stroud's voice said. She still had her comms link to the net. And I can still damn well hear you. 
and your daughter can hear you too. Carlos could face any risk to his own ass without thinking over much, but watching, worse, listening to someone else do the same was unbearable. He didn't expect her to make it. He fully expected to hear her scream and choke as an Indy saw her coming and put some heavy caliber round through her. All he could hear on the radio as she moved through the channels was occasional splashes and heavy breathing. It was hard to work out where anyone was in this terrain without popping up above the grass for a look-see and risking a headshot. Marcus ended up alongside Jacobs and his fire team, and Carlos almost fell over them. So, what about the other asp? Marcus said. Jacobs was reloading, feeling around in his pockets for another clip. What about the rest of the cav out there? It's the asp that's going to stop the ravens from coming in. I'm up for it. Carlos fought down something rising in his throat. It was an unsettled gut that reminded him he was a man, and hiding in the grass might have been the correct procedure for this situation, but it wasn't right. I can reach it if Stroud can. There was a sudden blaze of light and gas further down the field, a rapid volley of fire from a couple of LAVs in Mataki's direction. She definitely grabbed their attention. Long stop to all call signs, Stroud said. I'm ten meters from the asp. It's just idling at the moment, and the guy on top cover isn't looking my way. Carlos sighted up on it. He could see the faint green-lit shape moving at ground level. Ma'am, you are... Stand by. Carlos heard her breathing. He even heard the sock, sock, sock of boots thudding into wet soil. A man's voice said one word, nothing Carlos could understand, and then he saw Stroud take a leap onto the hull of the asp and drop something. One, two, three, into the top hatch. The guy on top cover dropped back inside rather than trying to scramble out. She didn't manage to slam the hatch and tried to jump clear, but her webbing snagged. She was hanging off the asp, caught with both boots off the ground. It swung its gun turret. It had seconds to live. And so did Helena Stroud. For a moment, she struggled and reached for her knife to cut the straps. Shit, she said. The explosion was bigger than Carlos expected. It blew the asp apart, flames shooting into the night sky. She dropped a shitload of ordnance into their laps. Ma'am, ma'am. Radio procedure went to shit again. Long stop, are you okay? Ma'am. It was the stupidest thing that he'd ever said. He knew it the moment the words left his mouth. But he always hoped, always knew that gears survived when they shouldn't have. He'd seen men survive penetrating brain injury. He'd seen miracles. But he couldn't see Stroud at all, and the asp was in pieces. When he finally moved the scope much wider off the target, 30 meters, and made sense of what he was looking at, he knew Major Stroud was beyond any help. Oh, shit, shit! Carlos still listened for breathing, insane as that was after what he'd just witnessed. But he couldn't even hear static on the comms channel. Marcus caught his belt as he tried to straighten up for a better look. Carlos was ready to sprint across the field, indies or no indies, and bring back what he could. Shit, we can't leave her! Down. Marcus said quietly, I know, I know. He put both hands to his ears this time and spoke quietly on the radio. Mataki, it's your show now. I heard, she said. Santiago, is that confirmed? Is she a T4? Tango 4, dead, beyond medical assistance. It was a clinical, neutral code for the triage of injuries. 
from the most urgent treatable case, T1, to the low-priority walking wounded at T3. But a T4 needed no medics. And Anya was listening on the net. Carlos fought to get a grip. There was no way he was going to say over the radio that Stroud was in pieces. It was starting to dawn on him that her daughter had heard it all, and he could imagine nothing worse. He thought of Dom. It was too much. Confirmed. She's Tango 4, he said. But so is the fucking asp. She did it. Mataki just paused a beat. Kelowna Control, Longstop is down. That's a T4. The distance and clarity was necessary. Carlos knew that. One more asp, Marcus said. He was talking to Mataki. They were the last NCOs, the last command of any kind left on the field. That's our biggest problem. It can take the ravens. You keep your arse right there, Phoenix, Mataki said. Wait one. Carlos could hear the chimeras still circling. They had to be waiting for Hoffman's party to exfil. They weren't going to thrash Asphalt Point. Poor frigging Anya, Marcus said to himself. He swallowed loudly enough for Carlos to hear. He seemed to be changing in front of Carlos's eyes, one death at a time. Jacobs, listen to those bastards. I don't think taking out that other asp is going to be enough. So, Anya Stroud had made her mother proud of her. At least that had been said in time. Most folks never got to say the things they should have before it was too late. But it was a shame the old girl couldn't hear her now. Anya's voice shook, like the signal was breaking up, but she did what she had to do, and Carlos could hardly bear to listen. Kelowna control to Pomeroy, she said. Longstop is down, Tango 4. There was a slight pause, as if she'd swallowed, but not long enough to count as losing it. I repeat, Longstop is down, Tango 4. Asfo Point, 16 years ago, 1 hour 10 minutes after landing. The ground shook as Hoffman herded the Asfo staff across the soggy turf. They were on their own now, and there were chimeras out there just tracking up and down, not engaging, not doing anything. Chimeras didn't just hang around sightseeing at night. They were there to pin down the exfil. The boats wouldn't get 200 meters before they strafed them. So the last thing Hoffman wanted was civilians adding to his problems. Get going! He yelled. Go on, run, run! Just get the hell away from this place before it blows up! He had to shove the men hard in the back. Timiu pushed one of the women. You're safer out there! Run! The scientists, still in night clothes, were too scared to run into open ground where they had no cover. Where Gears saw a chance to escape being pinned in a corner, unable to see the enemy, the civvies saw only noise, explosions, and imminent death. Ironic. So frigging ironic. This is what weapons do, folks. This is what your work creates. One woman just wouldn't move. She was about 30, rooted to the spot in a striped sports top and shorts, and she was simply too paralyzed by fear to, to leave the illusion of safety that the doomed building gave her. Morgan and Young came racing out of the entrance. Eight minutes, sir. Young grabbed the woman's arm and dragged her bodily across the compound. She screamed, but he just kept going even if she lost her footing. Timer's ticking down. You're going to end up dead, honey. Get the hell out. Move! Hoffman ran for the boats. They'd have to be lucky beyond belief to get past the chimeras. A heavy sea might have been helpful, making them a harder target to fix on, but the storm had picked the worst time to ease. 
prioritize, prioritize. We've got our own scientists. So the data comes first. Cleaner to Pomeroy. What's the maximum range of a bot with 60% charge? There was a pause, longer than Hoffman thought reasonable with live death sticking down behind him. Three kilometers, to be safe, Michelson said. Why? Ravens can get a fix on them, yes? You can pick up control and direct them? Yes, if you give the pilot a search area so he can get in range of their receivers. Then I'm sending them out on their own to a hover point, two clicks offshore. Grid reference, 590068. Get a raven in to retrieve them. Cleaner, just because Stroud didn't. I'm listening to a pack of chimeras prowling out there, Quentin. Attack helicopters and semi-inflatable craft do not play together. Just humor me, give the damn bots a good home, and then if the worst happens, we've got most of what we came for. Bots were tiny targets. They could hover offshore and avoid the chimera's attention, where even a small boat couldn't. Op Leveler was not going to be marked failed, not on Hoffman's watch. Roger that, Cleaner. Just don't be a complete gung-ho pillock this time, will ya? Hoffman took that as Michelson's wish for good luck. I'll try, he said. Timu, set the bots to free fly and hold at this location. He scribbled the grid death on the back of Timio's glove. Do it now. Great timing, sir. Just do it. He trusted Timio, but he still watched, knee-deep in the surf, as the bots folded arms and probes into their housings and maneuvered on jets of vapor before streaking out into the darkness. Six minutes. Ivo was in Benjafield's Marlin, bound and gagged, and Patrice and Moirik's daughter were in Cho's, just in case only one boat made it. Cross-loading cargo was always a sensible precaution. Dom pushed Benjafield's boat out into the surf with Hoffman. Hoffman could hear helicopters again. He knew he couldn't rely on Sea Company coming to the rescue with a well-aimed salvo. They were in enough trouble themselves. Dom's brothers out there. He must be going crazy with worry. Everybody in, Benjafield yelled. Sir, we've got room for a few civvies in each boat now. That all the ordnance is gone. Negative, Private. This isn't a rescue. Hoffman heaved himself into the marlin. He could see most of the ASFO staff shambling along the shore now, looking back at the facility as if they didn't believe that it was about to blow. But every time there was an explosion in the distance, they dropped flat for cover instead of running. Bye, Tuck! Bye, Tuck! Get your ass in this boat! Benjafield, hand on the wheel at the stern of the marlin, gave Hoffman that look. The look that said, it didn't have to be that way. And it hurt. Screw it, Benjafield. Who do we take with us then? You want to choose? We can't take them all. They are assets. You want to pick the smartest ones, the prettiest ones, or the most desperate ones? You leaving it to me, sir? He turned. Dom, Dom, grab some civvies. First six who'll come with us right now. He turned back to Hoffman. If it doesn't matter, sir, we'll take the willing. Bai Tuck waded out to Cho's boat. I go with Cho, he called to Hoffman. Morgan and Timu were carrying wounded Paisangas on their backs. Shim and Laoen need medical aid, too. I do that. Okay, sergeant. No bastards listening to me today. Timu, are those bots away? They are, sir. Dom didn't seem to have any trouble finding six passengers. Two women and four men edged down the shore, clearly nervous of the water, but Dom and the Pesanga ran out of patience and grabbed them like luggage, almost throwing them into the boats. Five minutes. 
Hoffman reached out to hold Dom in board, then slapped Benjafield on the back. Get going! The marlin roared away from the shore. Hoffman looked back at the other boat, now closing the gap with them. They were a hundred meters clear. Cleaner to Pomeroy. Bots are away, and we're clear of the blast zone. Poor Stroud. But she was always going to go out that way. And so will we. Pomeroy to Cleaner. Roger that. The sound of rotors was getting closer. Hoffman kept his NV goggles down and rested his lancer on the gunwale. He looked around the faces of the men in his boat, and bar a couple of the pesangas, they were all such kids. Little boys, unlined faces, lives not even begun yet, and they got to him like it never had before. Dom began taking off his armor. Private, what the hell are you doing? Dom kept looking at the sea. You try swimming in this, sir. That'll be the least of your problems if we get hit. Chimera guns can punch clean through these anyway. Nobody else followed suit, but then choosing the best way to die was a very personal matter. Hoffman was watching the shore now, checking his watch. And, right on time, Asphalt Point blew up. It wasn't one glorious movie scene explosion. It was a neat series of staccato detonations, right to left, like a giant burst of automatic fire along the beach. The flames lit up the water for a good distance. Hoffman saw nobody on the shore and stopped thinking if he'd done the right thing. And then died down very fast, settling into something that looked like a factory fire. Claim that on your insurance, indie boys, Timio said. That got a laugh, but it was short-lived. The rotor noise was suddenly much louder, and close enough to tell that it was moving across their bows to port. They saw the sea around them, whipped up by the downdraft, even before they could pick out the shape of the chimeras. Then it was almost above them, green lit and filling the sky. Benjafield pushed the throttle as far as it would go and tried to steer clear. It's okay, Dom said, for no apparent reason. It's going to be okay. The bright spotlight stabbed through the darkness and circled on the waves as if searching. Yes, we got the bots away, assholes. Hoffman wondered what they'd do with the seconds they bought. Joe! Joe, get away! Run for it! There's more than one chimera. It's just a gesture, but it's still better than sitting here and making it simple for them. The beam fell straight down on the marlin. Spray kicked up everywhere. Hoffman couldn't hear a thing now, except the throbbing engine shaking right above him. He leaned back and aimed his lancer anyway, because even a chimera had vulnerabilities at this range. Sorry, Dom. What with the new baby and everything? Across the water, closer than Hoffman had thought, the other marlin was caught in the sweep of a light, too. The pilot was looking for something. He didn't need a searchlight to aim. Then gunfire hit the sea, carving across the space between the two marlins. Cho's boat was hit. Hoffman saw the explosion of splintered composite, but the marlin was still afloat. You bastards! Dom was yelling. He opened fire, aiming up into the belly of the nearest chimera. You bastards! They're your own fucking civvies! But that was the whole point. Hoffman saw that now. And there I was, worrying about whether it was moral to shoot enemy scientists or not. Die moral. Big comfort. Dom emptied his clip and reloaded. Hoffman and Timio joined him. The searchlight veered off sharply. Hoffman heard the engine stutter, and then he could smell fuel. He felt something oily and pungent spray his face. Fuel. Transmission fluid. Whatever. Flammable. Shit! We're going to burn to death at frigging sea! 
Dom said. Timio kept firing in bursts. We hit the asshole! Hoffman saw the chimera was circling, getting lower, and then it belly flopped onto the sea a hundred meters away in a textbook ditch. All he could think of doing was firing on it, reloading, and firing again. The side hatch was open. If his boys were going to drown, then so was the chimera crew, and the fellowship of survival could go ram itself up the nearest pipe. He couldn't even think about Cho's boat. He knew he ought to. The other chimera broke off the attack and hovered above its stricken sister. It was amazing how suicidal all rotary pilots seemed to be. I'm going to die. Shit. Cho! Dom yelled. He dropped his lancer, kicked off his boots, and the last thing Hoffman saw was him disappearing over the gunwale into the black ink ocean around them.